Hello, everyone. I'm here with James Nestor, author of the book Breath, that is now in Colombia, actually. That's why we are doing this interview, actually, because I have your book in Spanish. And this book has been like a blessing for me because it has been teaching breathing for a lot of years. And some people doesn't believe me, you know, even being back up for the oxygen advantage. But your book is an eye opener for a lot of people. So even Patrick, talk about your book, like the most important text on breathing, book on breathing on the last 20 years. So I'm very honored to be here with you today. So how this adventure begins in your life? Because you came from the uh, free diving world, right? With, with your book and a lot of mouth breathing there, you know? And actually that's another question I have uh, for a moment. How you change your mind about free diving with the new work you are doing, but how this adventure begins to write breath? Uh, you know, it was a number of things. It wasn't one thing in particular. It was a number of things that kept adding up in my professional life, in my personal life. And once after several years of finding these sort of anachronisms in medical literature and finding different things that didn't really make sense to me on a personal level with my own health, I started investigating breathing much more deeply than I had ever done before. And so this again is, is a process that lasted for years and years. And it was when I met free divers that really alerted me that there was something much bigger and more powerful going on with our breathing than I had ever thought. Um, these people are doing things that are supposed to be medically and scientifically impossible. And yet They're doing them every day. And I learned how to free dive as well. And, you know, so I, I think people are looking for, you know, what was the one thing I woke up one day and said, I'm going to write a book about breathing, but uh, I, I wish it were that easy, but it's not. The, the tale of, of what really inspired me is much more convoluted and complicated. And, well, breathing is kind of, if you go to the free diving, it can be a little bit complex and extreme. But actually, breathing is something everyone does, but not everyone look at his breathing for healthy um, matters, you know? So you, in your book, put very simple things in the first part of your book, like nose breathing, close your mouth, the word with why showing is important. So why people must have breathing in mind when they think about their health? Hmm. I think that breathing is such a simple thing. It's so obvious that a lot of people don't consider how powerful it could be. And so these little hacks, I can tell you how to breathe properly in about 10 seconds, right? It's pretty easy. Breathe through your nose, breathe slowly, breathe light, breathe deep. There you go. That's all you need. You're, you're, you're good to go. But I, what I found as a science journalist was, was unless you understood why breathing this way was more beneficial if you once you understood how it affected your body where these practices came from you don't appreciate it and so much of health nowadays is so overly complicated nutrition and diet now is more complicated than it's ever been exercise is more complicated that sleep is getting more complicated these things don't have to be overly complicated uh, i think humans modern humans have done a good job of of convoluting a very simple message, but, but nature works in a very simple way. So if you follow nature as the guide for breathing, follow what any other animal in the wild is doing, then that's your guide. That's, that's how you should breathe. But it's fascinating once you start going out in the field, talking to researchers of how few of us in the modern world actually follow these these guidelines by nature. We don't eat in a natural way. We don't sleep in a natural way. We don't breathe in a natural way. And it's this is the main reason why so many of us are so diseased. And it's a little bit sad that we need to teach people how to breathe, actually, because it's something that born with you. And actually, our work with the Oxygen Advantage and you, and I think every breathing instructor in the world is to empower the person of his own health in some, in some uh, degree. 
So, uh, but the, the person of today need to understand with facts. And that's what you did. You put everything together, right? Because reading was like all over the place and you put it all together. And these, these findings, how change the way you look your own health when you look breeding in the whole spectrum? I think that, you know, as someone who is coming in from the outside, it's allowed me to just be curious about everything and to talk with everybody. So I had no objective starting this book. I still don't have an objective. I don't consider myself an evangelist for one way of breathing or the other. That's not my role here. I'm just a reporter. So I my job is to go out and to try to honestly report on what I've found. And, and really without having any skin in the game on, on one side of the argument or the other. So in some ways that's an advantage because you, you don't know anything and you accumulate facts and you talk to people and you develop your own story. And in other ways, it's a complete nightmare because you have to learn about biochemistry. You have to learn about respiratory physiology. You have to learn about all these things that are really complicated and take a long time in order to truly understand so that you can convey them back to an audience in a very simple way. So this book took a very long time. Uh, it, was a, it was a complete nightmare, but at the end of it, what I tried to do is to express clearly and honestly what I had found in this multi-year path researching this stuff. I'm sure other people can write other books. They might come to other conclusions that's all great. This is this is the best I could do, and and that is what it is. But you know, I work with I don't know doctors and um, a lot of professionals in the health field, and sometimes this information is new for them. Yeah. Even when there has been a lot of years studying in the university, so why professionals? In the health, in the health, in the doctors, hospitals, they don't know this. It's so basic. It's not a new era of breeding. It's in the in the books, in the research for years and years ago. So, yeah, why do you think is, that? This has been absolutely surreal for me in the past year. Half of the conferences and sessions and people I've been talking to are medical professionals, and some of them at, at very top institutions, top tier in research institutions. And at one place, which I won't name, they said, this stuff sounds crazy. Like, where'd you find this stuff? Where'd you research this? I said, well, actually this was researched at your institution right down the hall from you. And <laughs> The science is there. It's just so few people have the time and capacity or curiosity maybe to really look into it. So there are doctors in my family, there are pulmonologists in my family. They had never heard of the vast majority of the stuff I was bringing up. And they're pretty pissed off about it at, at the end of the day uh, be, because it is so basic and it can help people in, in such profound ways. It's free, it's simple. And yet you're trained in a certain school and a certain school of thought to just address chronic issues with a powder or a pill, which those things work. They absolutely, bronchodilators work, oral steroids work. Are they a good long-term durable solution to every problem? They are not, <laughs> you know? So I think that the problem is multifactorial. It has to do with doctors just not having the capacity. You're seeing 10 patients an hour, 15 patients. How are you gonna sit them down and tell them how to breathe properly? Impossible. Um, and it and it has to do with other influences on the current medical system as well. I don't want to get too conspiracy theorist, but uh, the one thing I've heard from so many doctors and researchers um, at top level institutions, Harvard, Stanford, Yale, is that there's no money in breathing, let's, let's be honest. And so there's not a lot of incentive to develop different breathing courses to to help people. Um, and let's let's also be honest that a lot of people do want a powder and they, they do want a pill and those things absolutely work. I'm more interested in the people who want to try to use their natural body to heal themselves. Uh, if people just want to tune out, 
use current medical interventions that have potentially harmful side effects, but do address the acute problem, that is their free will to do that. Um, so the, this book was, was trying to express this divergence in thinking and to offer some context on how to go about things in a different way that have been scientifically validated to work for several chronic conditions. Great, and that was like the foundation. So I want to go to the basics. I mean, nose breathing, because I know at the beginning you didn't want it to be part of the book so deeply, but then you started, you become the, the rat, right? You, you experience this in your body. And the first thing you did was plug your nose. And this for me as a breathing instructor is insane. But how was that experience with, with Anders Olsen? And why you think someone that breathes through his mouth cannot have uh, good health? Well, plugging your nose for 10 days sounds insane and it's insane. And it seems like a stunt, I get that. That was never the intention of that experiment. If you look at the tens of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people who contend with chronic sinusitis, rhinitis, inflamed turbinates, who have deviated septums, who uh, have allergies, who have chronically stuffed noses, they're breathing through their mouths all the time, right? So what we were doing was just lulling ourselves into a position that so much of the population already knew. The difference was we were measuring what happened to it, um, what happened to our bodies, what happened to our brains, what happened to so many different systems within us. So I, I realized, uh, and that's why I didn't want to do the experiment. I said, I don't want to do some supersize me thing that just seems like some jokey jackass stunt where I'm like, oh, I'm breathing through my nose for 10 days. Uh, the, the point was to, is A, no one else was going to do this experiment. We tried, uh, and 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 B, I wanted to personally experience what so many people I had talked to had suffered from, which was what happens when you're just breathing through your mouth. And another thing is, this experiment didn't prove anything. That was not the intention. What we were doing was just showing and personally experiencing what decades and decades of science has been telling us over and over and over again, that the pathway through which you breathe air profoundly affects your health. And I certainly felt that I'll never do it again. Um, don't suggest that anyone else do it. And if anything, I, I, I'm hoping it was a big warning, a big caution to people. If you're obstructed, you have to find a way of clearing your nose, period. You will never be healthy as a mouth breather. So it's not the same because I mean, I'm now preparing myself for a free diving um, contest. I don't know if that's a word, but here in my city, we don't have specifically uh, free diving teachers, you know, trainers. And for them, mouth breathing is very, very, it's like you need to breathe through your mouth, even out of the, of the pool, right? So it's not the same breathing through your nose than breathing through your mouth. Actually, Patrick said, what, how many functions your mouth do for your breathing? Nothing. It's just in emergencies, you, you can, you need to use it. So it's insane to say someone that is the same to breathe through your nose, breathe through your mouth, while what happened inside the nose that is so important for our, for our health? Oh, so many things happen inside the nose and, and Patrick's such a great teacher and explainer of this stuff. You know, we're humidifying the air, we're pressurizing it, we're conditioning it, we get more oxygen, we get more nitric oxide. Um, we're slowing down the air so that our lungs have more time to extract more oxygen. We get about 20% more oxygen breathing through our nose than we do equivalent breaths through the mouth. You think that's not going to make a difference in your life? You're crazy. So uh, this is all known stuff too. This, is, this has been around for decades and decades. You know, 100 years ago, 120 years ago, researchers were talking about nasal breathing, the benefits of nasal breathing. They were doing scientific studies into nasal breathing. So, so you know, as a reporter, 
my job isn't to actually do the research. I did that one experiment just as a conduit into the subject so I could bring readers into what it, what it feels like and what it looks like to breathe through your mouth. But I am just a filter. Uh, I find information. Uh, I find science. I review data sheets. I talk to experts in the field to put together the story. So, you know, what Patrick is saying shouldn't be revolutionary. Uh, and yet you mention it to people and people say, huh, never thought about that. I've been breathing through my mouth my entire life. And I'm certainly one of those people, right? <laughs> it wasn't until I was researching this book that I said, oh my God, I've been breathing through my mouth every single night. I know that because I wake up with a dry mouth, have this huge glass of water next to my bed. And I breathe through my mouth during exercise all the time. And once you realize this, you say, why hasn't someone told me this? You know, when I was a kid, uh, my face would have looked different. We know that. Um, so I would have been breathing better as, as an adult. It affects your skeletature. It affects your musculature. It affects your airways. It affects your brain function. Um, if you have trouble breathing during sleep, it can affect how tall you grow. Uh, it affects whether or not you get diabetes. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And again, these aren't my hypotheses. This is, this is standard science. So it's these simple things that are right in front of our face, just like our nose right in front of our face that people get so blown away by, but they're like, I had no idea. And yet it's been there the whole time. Um, and, and so it was fun to research that and, and realize that we've been missing out on this. Such a, a wondrous way of bringing air into our bodies and out of our bodies through, through the nose and, and all the benefits that that has. And the impact in the craniofacial growth in the kids, I think it's very important to say this to parents, to teachers, because okay. this is a problem that develop can, can be worst if a child before his 13 years read through his mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Can have an impact, a profound impact in his in his head. And in this adult in generations, if we change the way our kids breathe. Because I mean, right now, 10% of the population have ADHD. That's insane. And yeah. our kids. And our kids are growing and parents doesn't know that. And it's so simple, so simple. Why is it important for a kid to breathe through his nose and assess uh, breathing when they are growing? Well, I think that you touched on this a bit is how you hold your mouth, how you hold your tongue is going to influence how your face develops. So if throughout your early stages of development, you're like this, and you swallow like this, that upper palate isn't going to develop wide enough and it's not going to spread out, okay? It's going to move up instead of spreading out, which is going to make your mouth smaller, which is going to make you more apt to have crooked teeth when you're older, which is going to inhibit the full development and the full potential of your airways to smaller mouth, smaller airways. That upper palate moving up is going to occlude the sinus passages too. Makes it harder to breathe through the nose. So what do you do? You breathe through the mouth. So you see this all the time. You know, some estimates have said that 35 to 50% of kids are habitual mouth breathers. If you get kids with adenoid problems, inflamed adenoids or tonsils, that percentage goes way up. And what you said about ADHD and ADHD-like symptoms of behavioral problems, bedwetting, neurological issues, growth issues, digestional issues, like all of these different issues, so many of them can be tied back to sleep disordered breathing. And I was so aghast when I started talking to leaders in the field, started reviewing the work of Christian Kimono down at Stanford, who is considered the, the godfather of sleep medicine, been studying this stuff for 50 years. He's been writing about this for decades and decades. And the fact that kids who have these issues are, are just immediately given medications to keep them up in the day and to let them go to sleep at night is, is I think, such a gross injustice uh, to them. Uh, it really is. It's, it's like if those issues persist 
then I believe, this is my personal opinion, the first thing you should do is look at breathing patterns and especially breathing during sleep. If the kid is suffering from snoring or sleep apnea, there's a good chance they're gonna have issues down, down the road and that needs to be addressed immediately. And again, this, this is not controversial stuff. People who study this have been trying to get this message out for a long time. Who is it getting out to? I, this is the first time I ever heard about it was a few years ago. Which is which is crazy, but I think awareness is is really growing now, and and that's what it's all about. Yeah, I I mean, and the nose when a kid breathes through his nose, I mean, if we um, achieve that these generations of kids breathe through their noses, I mean, this can be the the basis yeah. nose uh, dysfunctional breathing is the foundation of a lot of chronic chronic issues so do you think if we do a good job as as you and all the instructors around the world to spread the word up around, about breeding we can have a new generation of people that can enjoy themselves more that they doesn't have to suffer of anxiety and maybe be happier and don't fight against life all the time I would love to have that outlook on on the world today. I don't I don't quite have it, uh, but but maybe I will. Maybe I can change my mind. Uh, I think a good parallel is to look at how quickly our mouths shrunk, how quickly our breathing went to hell, how quickly our teeth grew crooked, and it's been shown in a single generation, teeth can grow and crooked, mouths can get too small, respiratory problems can develop, because respiratory problems can often be a, a result of a mouth that's too small for its face because you have a smaller airway, right? And that upper palate moves up. So within a single generation, we can ruin our teeth, ruin our mouths, um, in a large part, ruin our breathing, which means in a single generation too, you can likely improve on this or, or fix it. And Patrick has wrote something which I thought was so fascinating in, in his book. He said that about 40 to 50% of our facial development is epigenetic. So it is determined by environmental input. So genetics plays a big part, right? But the other half is how you hold your mouth, what foods you chew, um, what, what other inputs you put in to develop your facial structure. And you can see this from twins some of whom were breastfed versus those who were bottle fed. And I'm not pointing fingers at anyone for breastfeeding or bottle feeding. Just want to be really gotten into a lot of trouble with that before. But um, I'm just giving you information here. Or, or kids who were given soft foods early on or, or weaned on to hard foods or kids who had braces and didn't have braces. And look at the vast changes in their profile and the vast changes that occur within their faces, even within twins. So to me, this makes perfect sense, right? Uh, that you want to start with a good foundation. You start with something solid early on, and it's so much easier to build upon that instead of having to go back and fix what was broken, which is why pediatric dentistry and orthodontics is going to be, mark my words, this is going to be huge because these experts and researchers look at kids at six months old. They look at kids at a year old. They said, this kid's going to be a snore. This kid is having trouble breathing. Let's fix it now. And then they, when they develop and grow older, their mouths are big enough so their teeth come in straight. You know, So uh, I think with technologies that we have now and with awareness that we have now, we can fix a lot of these problems that we've uh, afflicted with ourselves, to ourselves, I should say, in the last 200, 300 years. People have a hard time believing that, that, our ancestors all had straight teeth. They had wide airways, they had wide noses. 90% of us have crooked teeth. What's going on here? If we broke it, we can fix it. Yeah, it's this, this, this evolution that you mentioned in your book, and doesn't make any sense. And another part of the puzzle is breathing less. It's something that I called the breathing paradox. Breathe less to oxygenate more. And at the beginning, I mean, I started with this four years ago. And for people was like, I don't get it. Even when I explain about the carbon dioxide, the importance, how 
breathing really works inside of us. It's not just getting air inside your body. It's a complex mechanism. So how you explain someone that doesn't get it, why it's important to breathe less? Well, that's your job as a breathing therapist to explain that to people. I have the easy job of just writing books and going away. So you're <laughs> having, to, having to field all these questions. Uh, the only explanation I would have is, you know, when, when you tell people that, they say, you're great. This is some new age crystal thing. You're, you're insane. And then you say, like, check out the work of Christian Bohr 120 years ago. Check out the work of Yandel Henderson 100 years ago, 80 years ago. You know, check out the work of Buteyko. We, we've known this for so long. This is basic biochemistry of how oxygen disassociates from red blood cells and gets into hungry cells in our body. And yet people still don't get it because we think in the modern world that more is more. More is always better, right? I, I, I'm out of breath. I need to breathe more. But once you start to understand the biochemical aspects of this, and then you understand the biomechanical aspects of it, you realize that it's, it's not making any sense. It's like having a car at a stop sign, every stop sign just revving your motor over and over and over. Are you going any faster doing that way? Are you running any more efficiently doing that way? No, you're not. Because when you breathe too much, I, I can't believe I'm telling you this. You're here, the expert. You know what happens. <laughs> when you I breathe know. too much, you tend to breathe up into the upper lobes, okay? And you tend to just take air into your throat, into your mouth, into your bronchi. But they don't enter the lungs. That And the lungs are the things that participate in gas exchange. And the lower lungs are much more efficient than the upper lungs. So, duh, of course you're going to be getting less oxygen and you're going to be working too hard to get less when you're <laughs> and you especially feel this and see this when you're exercising it's the hardest thing to convince someone when they're exercising they need to breathe less to get more oxygen i'm sure you have to deal with this every day um but but it's true and look at a pulse oximeter look at you know science from 100 years ago and, and you see how true it is well I hope in a couple of years, people get it easily, you know? <laughs> but let's see what happens. I mean, maybe it's better that they don't get it because now I have a job for that, yeah. so. <laughs> It'll keep you employed. Yeah, exactly. So, but don't get it, people. Keep over breathing. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, and how this, um, all this knowledge change the way you train for free diving? Because I'm personally in free diving right now. I'm pretty new in the field. I just started practicing three weeks ago. This is a crazy stuff I will do, like going to this competition. But how you introduce what you learn researching for breath, your book, to free diving? Because there is a lot of mouth breathing there. There's, there's a lot of mouth breathing there. But what people don't get, it's, it's like when people say, well, Wim Hof breathes through his mouth. Wim Hof hyperventilates. People don't see the other 23 and a half hours of the day when Wim Hof mm -hmm. isn't on stage. He's humming. He's breathing through his nose. He's very breathing very slowly, very lightly in a chill way. That's not very fun to watch someone breathe like that. Here, I'll do it for five minutes. We'll see how fun that is to watch me. See, not very fun. Uh, I, I stopped <laughs> that early because nobody nobody wants to see that. So it's the same thing with free divers. And I know a lot of free divers have spent a lot of time in that community. Yeah, you're breathing through your mouth for those few breaths, right? Uh, before you go and dive. These mm -hmm. people are so in tune with their breathing. The rest of the time, they're breathing very slowly, very calmly through their noses. There's a lot of humming going on, but everyone just sees the <gasps> <gasps> And to be clear, we're talking a lot about mouth breathing uh, and all the bad things. And yes, chronic mouth breathing is a problem. Okay, I tried to make this clear in the book. I'm still getting hundreds of emails of people saying, I took two mouth breaths today. I'm worried that I'm going to get cancer. So, so I'm talking about chronic mouth breathing. So when you're laughing, when you're sighing, 
before taking a big dive, even when you're doing some pranayama or kundalini techniques, if you're doing Wim Hof method, you want to breathe through your mouth, go for it. No one's judging you. When you're done with that, go back to nasal breathing. At night when you're sleeping, nasal breathe the whole way through. No reason to mouth breathe at all. So with, with free diving, I was always one of those hyperventilators before I, I did a big dive. Uh, I would just breathe as much as I possibly could and go under. And you realize later that that is dangerous because what it's you're doing dangerous. is offloading too much CO2 and your oxygen levels can actually get very low to a dangerous level, but you weren't sensing the need to breathe because your CO2 levels have been too low. This is a little complicated, but for free divers, they know this. So it's much better in free diving. You can take these big enriching breaths, but they should be calm and fluid and mellow and you should relax yourself. And you're getting into competitions, that's your prerogative, go for it. I much prefer the other side of free diving where when my body tells me it's time to breathe, I'm gonna go to the surface and go up and get a breath of air and come back down and enjoy this activity as a meditation. That's the kind of free diving I'm into, but whatever floats people's boats is cool by me yeah and you're right i mean nose breathing is not a religion <laughs> right no. because can become that and it's not about about it it's understanding what is going on in your body when you breathe through your nose when you breathe through your mouth and then you can decide when you go and breathe through your mouth like when you will take the first <gasps> to go down in the water so we have to Make that clear. And I know you make it very clear in the book, but a lot of people um, is going that extreme. Never breathe through your mouth. And that doesn't make any sense. No. It's not it about would. that. It, it doesn't. But, but this is just, to me, it's a great analogy of how extreme our cultures are. It, the people have to be either zero or 100%. People learn about some new breathing techniques and they stop everything and no, this should be done very lightly. You should acclimate your body very slowly, right? It's the same thing with diet. People hear someone on a podcast talking about a new diet. They stop their diet immediately and switch over. I guess that keeps the economy running. It keeps America open for business, and that's that's fine. But, but uh, don't approach breathing this way. I, I really think that breathing, especially if you've been breathing dysfunctionally for a long time, very gently and gradually get into it. And I would have the same advice for free diving. We're talking a lot about free diving. Some people on a single weekend say, I'm gonna go down to 200 feet within three days. Go for it if that's, if that's what you wanna do. You might get seriously hurt, but for me, free diving was much more pleasurable to go down five feet for a few seconds, go down 10 feet for a few seconds, go down 20 feet before you know it, you're down at 70 or 80 feet and you feel very relaxed. It's this very gradual thing. It takes your body a long time to acclimate to things. So, so I would not push it with, with any of these exercises. Good advice. Actually, I'm uh, doing it just for the challenge for doing it, but I don't want to be a, an expert free diver. And well, I want to know how you met Patrick McKeown, because I know you have a couple of lines in your book but now you are like very close and you talk a lot and you call him for conversations, how you met each other. Was after the book, how was that? No, I, um, so I had read his sort of later in the game about halfway, three quarters of the way through my research, I found all of his books and read them. I said, wow, this guy's really on it. And I liked his story. So I reached out to him and I said, hey, do you want to do, I have a few questions. And I was very clear. I said, I'm a journalist as well. I'm writing a book about breathing. Uh, I, I've seen some of your research and it's the same research that I found. We had a great conversation. And at the end of the conversation, <laughs> I probably shouldn't say this, but he, he said, he's like, you know, a lot of people call me up and they just steal everything I tell them and they don't give me any credit. And I said, I promise you, I'm not one of those people. I'm going to give you folk anything that, that I'm taking from someone else's work. I'm going to credit and I'm going to acknowledge them. And I do that in the book. We, I had a much longer conversation with him specifically about 
uh, mouth breathing and exercise and all of that got cut. The, the book was um, 285,000 words. Uh, the current book you have is about 90,000. So a lot of stuff had to got, got left on the cutting room floor. So after that conversation, you know, I gave him an early copy of the book. I said, this is, this is my view of this, this stuff, how I came into it. He really liked it. And um, then we just kept talking. Uh, you know, I really think that it benefits everyone by working together. Uh, you know, I don't know if Patrick agrees with 100% of what I've said. I don't know if I agree with 100% of absolutely everything he says. That's not the point. The, the, the point is he's done the work, he's done the research, he's an expert in the field, he's experienced this personally, he's helped treat thousands and thousands of people. And I think the vast majority of what he says, he's light years ahead of, of everyone else. So it's been a real privilege to get to get to know him and to swap different scientific studies and continue on with this conversation. And um, what I love about Patrick is he opened the door for a lot of people to understand the science behind behind reading and start teaching it like me and i think right now it's not about um what you believe or um having a guru it's not about that is how you understand reading and how you can help others to empower themselves and I think the most important part of the Oxygen Advantage and the Buteyko Clinic that he has is putting all these persons together, all this family together. And uh, in the Oxygen Advantage, what Patrick said, I like the Oxygen Advantage because it's not um, based on any kind of belief or guru. I just take the science, I put it together, and I put this method together so you can use it and help people. And of course, we are always open to listen others. We don't fight with Wim Hof, we don't fight with other methods. You can use the oxygen advantage to complement what you do. And I think if, if we all go together as one, know like you are this method, you are this other method, and we fight each other, and I don't like that. But if everyone just have the fundamental knowledge about breathing, you know, like the first part of your book, Breathe through your, nose, through your nose, breathe slowly, you know, all these kind of things that are almost universal. You cannot harm anyone with this. The worst thing that can happen is that this person can improve his health. So what do you think is the future of breathing? Do you think people will open more to this? Uh, I hope so. And what I've seen in this community is it, it is a lot more open and supportive. It's not like everyone is constantly trying to defend their ground or, or exactly. ripping on other people because you don't get anywhere doing that. Uh, it's been a real privilege to get to know Wim Hof. I've spoken with him a few times. And, and again, he's someone, do I agree with 100% of every single thing he's ever said? No. Does he agree with? But but the foundation, we're, we're both have the the same mission is to try to disseminate this information to people to to help people em empower their own health right anders olsen as well such an amazing guy done such amazing work and it's it's just so great to be able to know these people and and to feel that there isn't this underlying competition like someone's always trying to steal something from someone else it really feels supportive because and I think everybody wins when you're able to come together in that way. So much of the world now is so divisive that people are just looking for issues that they can uh, ridicule someone over. And, and no one wins when, when you do that. So again, it, it's not about uh, agreeing or worshiping one method or the other. It's about considering these things and acknowledging that science is not a closed book book. It's not a closed door. It's constantly changing. I know that Patrick's views on hyperventilation training have changed a bit in the last few years. And my views on hypoventilation training on breath hold restriction has have really changed in the past few years too. We're honest about this. Things develop. I'd be very worried about someone who's been saying the same thing 
in the scientific community for 30 years because mm -hmm. we've learned a lot since then and, and you have to progress and keep up on the latest research if you're really going to be able to have a, the full breadth of knowledge on a subject. Actually, in his new book, he have a little, a little bit of implementation. So he's open. I mean, there you go. Well, that, there you go. That's pretty cool. And you have a book. It's called Get High Without Drugs. Yeah. So how yeah, that it, get high now without drugs, everybody. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, uh, amazing you're bringing this up. I'm going to tell you a story about this. Um, I, this was, I wrote that book uh, 11 years ago. Um, well, because when, an uncle, uh, right? It was a full, uh, it was through Chronicle Books. My my uncle was this, this playboy who lived in the Hollywood Hills, successful businessman, orange Corvette, pantsuits, um, the whole deal. And he passed away and I was going through uh, all the records in his house. He was a big hippie, um, you know, really into meditation. And I found all these crazy notes and methods of, of meditation and different ways of altering your consciousness. And as, as a joke, I pitched this book to, to Chronicle Books. I was very hard up for money at this time. And I like the book. The book combines humor and science and different ways of using your natural body to, to alter your consciousness and, and to benefit your health. The editor and the publisher gave it that name, and uh, I've just never been able to live that down. I hated it when they mentioned it. I said, no, I'm not going to write a book. No, no. Uh, but they they were the ones with the uh, paycheck, and, and they insisted this was the right title. They were wrong. Uh, however, the content of that book, uh, I, I think, is uh, some people might find of interest. I, I tried to approach these things in an accessible way, make it fun, but also to have real science behind it. So that's what that book is. I will give it a chance. And it's very interesting for me because here in Colombia, we work with, of course, with fusion and bring, but I work with meditation with my family. All my family are pulmonauts. Actually, my nickname is the Respironauts. The <laughs> name was before your book, okay? Wow. It was before the book. Yeah. I didn't the steal that from you, I swear. I would have given you credit, had I. You, you must do. <laughs> okay, and we work with breathing, but we work with meditation, and with ayahuasca and plants. And we are mixing both together. How you can um, lead or um, teach someone to breathe so they can go through the experience more relaxed and having more power in their nervous system. Because sometimes the bad experiences with these plants is because the, the person just panic. It's a new experience. And they panic and they just, everything becomes hell. So we, here in my house, we have the shaman that come and we uh, bring together breed work and plants. And of course, meditation. And the experience has been beautiful mm. with people with mental issues, uh, addictions, and another kind of emotional things or physical things. And I think I saw that book your book and maybe it's like yeah you can get high without drugs of course but plants and ancient plants you, can, you can get high with drugs role. too is what you're saying yeah <laughs> okay because i mean plants are not drugs but plants is like when you do holotropic breathing you know sometimes you need to push hard if you want to to transcend something inside you. So the plants, ayahuasca, peyote, uh, well, LSD is more chemical, but you know what I mean? And this mixed with someone that work with his breathing can be a very, very deep experience and can help a lot of people. So have you tried any time any of these plants? I have not. Joe Rogan really, really put me on the ropes on the ropes with that when I was talking to him. I, I have never done ayahuasca. 
Um, it's interesting. I was talking with Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins University, one of the top research institutions here in the U.S., who has been doing a lot of work with mushrooms, and I think he's uh, and, and and incredible work in finding it's it's more effective than any other therapy. And just this morning, Dr. Alyssa Eppel at University of California, San Francisco. Uh, she just invited me to um, attend a psychedelics conference where it's psychiatrists, psychologists, um, and other people in academia who are studying this stuff in a real way. And I think it's so exciting um, when it's done under the right terms in the right way. And that that's where I, I think it, it is very uh, important. I mean, if you think about people who have serious mental health issues, with PTSD, who have other issues, the amount of options that are given to them, amount of drugs, uh, they're just numbing this, this problem. And they work kind of well for doing that. SSRIs really don't work any better than placebos in the vast majority of people, unless you have serious depression. But these drugs seem to do something to the brain. They seem to reboot the brain in, in a very real and beneficial way when they're done under controlled and proper circumstances. So. To me, it makes perfect sense that you could incorporate breath work in with these other rituals and plant medicines to elicit a positive response. Um, and it sounds like you do this responsibly. It sounds like it's in a very controlled environment. And uh, and what a wonderful thing. It is. And you know, I used to work with people with uh, very deep issues, mental issues, addictions, uh, even agoraphobia. And with breathing, you can help them a lot. And because, but sometimes in some point, this thing is the push they need to go through mm -hmm. the thing. And going outside the plants and ayahuasca and all this stuff, because I use, I have a lot of experiences. I'm sorry, my English is not perfect. And maybe sometimes- Your English I is great. Myself. Thank you. Better than my Spanish, so. <laughs> okay, good, that's good. And I used to live with indigenous people here in Colombia, and I had a lot of research around this, how they do things, and now looking how they breathe even. Because if you go to very deep uh, communities, the shape of the faces are insane. It's be beautiful to see. But uh, going outside that world, maybe we can have that conversation sometime. Um, but you taught at the end of, of your book, about breathing plus. And you talk about hyperventilation. And in the oxygen advantage, we have the high altitude training. You know, it's breath holding without the hyperventilation and a breath hold after the exhalation. So you break the, the balance of your body, the um, chemical balance of your body. And you force the body to do adaptations. And I have my sister, she have lupus. Me actually, show you my sister now. <laughs> but uh, we did the high altitude training and in some point the inflammation start to diminish. Mm. So I think there is, we need a lot of research around all these things. But I think if you do and do breath holds after the exhalation, and you have a hypercarbonic hyper response, an epoxy response, and you can influence the, um, the um, immune uh, response of your body. And that's pretty amazing that you can do that just by breathing. And I had used the high altitude training with persons with agoraphobia, and they wanted, they was sick of taking medication. So, we use this technique and they in two weeks they told me it's insane i feel mm -hmm. that i'm taking medication but i'm not taking medication mm -hmm. and i think it's because the carbon dioxide so i know there is a lot of things we need to understand around breathing but i think we are going to the right path and this book you of you that you wrote is an open door for a lot of people to understand the power of this. So, I don't know, do you think that breathing can be, um, I don't know, important of the next step for really treat 
mental health, some mental health issues. I think yeah, I, without having my opinion in here, because I try not to have opinions as a reporter, but I will paraphrase what many psychologists, neuropsychologists, psychiatrists have, have mentioned to me is they have found it to be the single best intervention for panic, for other fear-based disorders. And there's currently, thankfully, more research going into CO2 therapies right now, uh, where they give people with panic, other anxieties, agoraphobia, even anorexia, depression, CO2. They give them CO2 because these people have such a hard time holding their breath because they're acclimated to have very low CO2 in their bodies, right? Because they associate an increase of CO2 with an attack. That's when they get this constriction. So they breathe like this all the time. So it's hard to get them to hold their breath. So they give them CO2 and a big bolus of CO2. It's doing the same thing that you're doing. It's just using another technology, right? And it helps to get them over that hump so that they can then start incorporating breath holding techniques and be more comfortable with it. It's like it wakes their body up to um, starts to acclimate them to having more CO2 and being comfortable with, with that in their bloodstreams um, for their chemoreceptors to be more flexible. So, uh, there has been CO2 research for over 100 years. I included some of it in the book. I had to cut out about 20 to 30 pages. I really did a deep dive into this stuff, spent several months in it. In it. And it has, according to these top level researchers, it is the most effective therapy out there for uh, anxiety, for panic, and more. And uh, it was extremely popular 80 years ago, being studied at top institutions, and then it just went away. So that's why I kept finding the same pattern, which mm -hmm. is why the new science of a lost art, it, we keep losing it and finding it, losing it and finding it, losing it and finding it, and it's, it's crazy. So it seems like we're on this upswing right now with CO2 research, which is really exciting. But what you're doing by altitude training, by breath holding at the end of exhales, that's CO2 training, <laughs> you know, it's, exactly. it's the same From thing. Inside. It just has From a different, inside. you're using your natural body. It has a different name. So we know it's effective. I hope that there's going to be a lot more studies into this. I'm still in contact with Dr. Justin Feinstein, who's a real leader in this field. And he's so excited to get back in the lab once COVID washes over us and, and to continue doing this research. Yeah, the Justin work and the part of the CO2 was very interesting for me because maybe we don't understand fear, right? So, I mean, we think we know everything and maybe we don't know anything. How CO2 levels, the chemoreceptors on the brain are connected with fear and maybe how we can help these people because, I mean, some people with panic attacks, anxiety, they go to the psychologist, right? Because they think it's something emotional. But maybe psychologists need these kind of tools and maybe they can help more people if they understand the foundations of this. What's well, this psychologists have, have been using cabinometers for, for 50 years, for 60 years. Um, so they, they've been in on this. Uh, Robert Freed in the 1960s and 1970s He's at, at Cooney Hunter School uh, in New York, has been talking about, he wrote four books about this stuff. So again, it's, it's not new. Um, and and I, I agree, it's, it's, I learned this stuff from psychologists, right? That, that's who told me about this. And it's very interesting to see so many of them reinvigorated with this research and, and all of them um, starting to get very excited about doing new studies because it's so obvious the science has been there for a long the measurements have been there um it just people need further convincing i guess in order to get it paid for from insurance which is really the name of the game here in the u.s and you know hearing in these countries sometimes we are five years back of you 
-hmm. in the states and everything what i'm what i'm trying to change that because as you said you learn this from psychologists so but the but majority of the population maybe don't know this so what i want to do with this interview with you and my work with the oxygen advantage and other experts is to bring faster the information about breeding to the spanish market so we can help more people and empower more professionals and giving these tools for them to help more so uh, i think we can go to questions and answers i mean i i'm new in this platform it's called stream stream io and i don't know what the comments are but my brother is helping me I don't know. This is my first time on this as well. I just okay. pressed record, so I hope everyone's seen and hearing. Okay. Everything. Now I have he I have them here in my in my my. Are we phone. streaming on Instagram or is this live? I have no idea. This is live. It's live in YouTube and it's live in Facebook. <laughs> wow. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Okay. I think that yeah. for, for people to have, I'm just talking into a screen right now. I have no idea where this stream is going, but but now I do. So uh, I was a little confused about that. I wouldn't have cussed so much uh, had I known, but too bad. You're going to have to deal with some curse words, everybody. That's it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I wrote yeah. you in the email. Sorry about that. <laughs> that we were going live. Okay. Good. So, Sean. He's one instructor for the Oxygen Advantage. Uh, this is not introduced in school. It took outside the schooling to be introduced to the dynamics of the breath. Yeah. Um, okay. Sean Flood was my eye-opening doorway into the phenomenal potential with the breath. And the Patrick McKeon really showed the science of the blood chemistry of how health is harnessed. Boom. Thank you, Sean. Okay, uh, I see a lot of comments, but I want to find the questions. Okay, I have one from Anastasis Zaniz. He's from Greece, one of our instructors. Thank you, Anastasis, for joining us. Who other breeding teachers does James consider it is worth following and studying under a side Patrick? <laughs> I don't want to name names. Um, I, I think that so many teachers uh, can offer so many benefits. Uh, find the one that, that you respond to the best. Patrick's got a really wide berth on his view on breathing, so that's a good place. Anders Olsen's great. Uh, I like Wim. Wim has more of a singular approach to, to his breathing and, and what he likes to do. But, um, I mean, find someone that, that you respond to that, that you're getting uh, good results from and and stick with that. So that's a long way of just fudging an answer there. I have no specific names to offer you. Okay. Uh, Saram Bel Belikowski. James, can you explain mouth breathing in Wing Method? Just your opinion. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. If, if you're going to breathe through your mouth for 20 minutes a day and you're going to hyperventilate, that's fine. To do it on Wim Hof method. I find there's a lot more benefits nasal breathing during Wim Hof method. Um, I, I much prefer to nasal breathe, but do whatever works. Uh, again, this is 20 minutes a day. This is, I'm not saying go and mouth breathe for 24 hours a day. It's 20 minutes a day. If it's easier for you to mouth breathe, do it. If you want to challenge yourself a little bit and breathe through your nose, do that. If you want to breathe a little slower and not get as high from breathing, you can breathe through your nose. I much prefer nasal breathing. Sometimes in through the nose, out through the mouth works, but I like inhales and exhales through the nose when I'm doing these quote unquote hyperventilation techniques. I just, I feel it so much more strongly and you feel the diaphragmatic motion so much more profoundly this way. Um, but do what works for you. I do it with my nose too, but it doesn't matter if you do it with your mouth. It's nope. okay. Um, do you know uh, from take a deep breath question for, for James, do you know why we can flare our nostrils and what is the benefit of this? Why we can flare our nostrils? Flare. 
Cam flu. I would assume yeah. I'm now flaring my nostrils right when you said that. I would assume that's to get more air in at times of stress, right? Um, and I'm not stressed now, but I'm I'm just starting to do this. This is now a, a terrible habit I have. Uh, I have not looked into the um, the conscious control of nostril flaring. But I would assume it's that, that they have the ability to open up so that we can get more air in through our noses. Good. And I have a lot of highs. Hello, James. And sending lot of, lots of love. And yep. Okay. <laughs> Hi, James. Love your book. Where can I learn more about the techniques created by the woman who used breath work to treat scoliosis? Uh, Katrina Scroth. Katrina Scroth. You can contact the Schroth Method School, which I believe is still in Austria. It was in Greece for a time, but now it's in Austria. Johns Hopkins University is also still uh, 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 teaching the Schroth Method. There are various other instructors out as well. Just know what she was doing, it was no more complicated than stretching and breathing. What does this look like when I do this? Looks a lot like yoga to me. I don't know. It would be crazy that that activity that's been around for 5,000 years. That's what that seems like to me. But this is an extreme version. I actually knew somebody, I still know her, uh, that used this for her own scoliosis. It's much more intense because Schroth was German. Of course, it needs to be more intense. <laughs> and so a lot of like stretching, contorting their body, breathing into this lung, breathing out of that lung, um, that kind of thing. But I can't tell you exactly how to do it, but the school certainly could. And it's insane how lungs give shape to the body. So if we have to think about the non-respiratory functions of your respiration, you know, your breathing muscles, right? If you're, there's an old Chinese, I think it's 1700 years old that says, if the form is perfect, the breath is perfect too. So of course your posture is gonna dictate how you're able to breathe. Belisa Vranich has done some amazing work in posture and the biomechanics of breathing. And we lose about 30% of our capacity to breathe when we're hunched over like this. And she's also mentioned that we have 11 pounds of respiratory muscles and these muscles need to be fit and they need to be stretched and they need to be worked out just like any other muscle if they're gonna be able to work properly. And so much of us go through through our days like this or looking at our phone. And even if we wanted to breathe healthy that way, we couldn't, and and here's an example. Why don't you just take a big, enriching breath through your nose? Look what immediately happens to your posture and your body when you do that, right? You can't take that big, enriching breath and get those six liters of air into your lung if you're if you're hunched over like this. It's it's impossible. So both those things need to go together, and you'll look better if you're breathing more more fully because your posture will be up unless you think it looks better to be like this which which you'll look better if you are breathing more poorly so um i'm not going to get into body aesthetics but our bodies if you look at nature as the guide once again look at any other animal look at how it's breathing i'm looking at my dog she's sitting right over there she's asleep and she's just breathing into her belly mm -hmm. and out, right? She is not a mouth breather, except when she's thermoregulating, then she'll <laughs> breathe like this the rest of the time, breathing. That's our guide. This is what our ancestors did. This is what all the other mammals on the planet do. We should do it as well. And the connection in the lung, with the lung capacity, capacity and longevity is, wow. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the quicker studies. your lungs shrink, the quicker they become diseased, the harder it is to breathe, the quicker you're going to die. And that's what the data has shown us. And to me, it makes perfect sense. We get most of our energy through breath. We don't get most of our energy through food or for drink, as, as a lot of people think. That's where you're getting. No, we get most of our energy through the air that we breathe. That's not to say 
You don't need food. You don't need drink in order to, we need all these things, but most of it comes from our breath. So of course, if you're struggling to do anything 25,000 times a day, it's going to wear on your health. And the last thing you need when you're 70 or 80 years old is to struggle to breathe. So the good news is it's reversible. All that shrinkage of the lungs, for most people, it's reversible. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when you reverse it, you're able to breathe more easily. Your body is able to work more efficiently. That's what it's all about. Great. Thank you so much for that. Okay, James, recently cited a report about health benefits of using breathing device. Has he tried this personally? Breathing into bags? No, breathing device, a device. Breathing, breathing device, sorry. Um, there are dozens of breathing devices. There's a bunch that have come out in the last six months. Um, some of them I think are effective and some of them are great training wheels to get you to where you want to go. I like Anders Olsen's uh, relaxator. It's such a simple, very small device. It just controls your breathing pattern. There are different apps, there are different gizmos. All these things, depending on what you're looking for, can work. I like the technology that's inside my brain and my lips and my lungs. That's pretty good technology. Um, but you can use whatever whatever you find is offering the most benefit. I, I can't recommend anything right now, but I'm not going to say that these, these devices are crappy and you don't need to use them. Everyone's different, right? Use what works. Yeah, I can say just start with your body. Start yeah. exploring your body, and after that, you can find out what works for you. For uh, sure. Start with your own technology. Okay, James, can you describe your daily, weekly, regular report practice? How has it evolved as you've grown in your practice? Yeah, just 12 hours a day. I'm focusing on my breathing uh, for four. No, I don't do any of that. So uh, a lot of people think that since I wrote this book, I'm now just, you know, wearing a robe and and um, I'm just sitting around my house focusing on my breath. But that that is not my job. <laughs> my job was to become a reporter and interview some people that sit around in robes and focus on their breath all day. That's my job. So that's not to say I didn't pick up some tricks, right? I picked up a lot of tricks from Patrick, from Wim, from Anders, learned a lot from him. And yes, I incorporate these things into my day-to-day -day life but I am not a breathing therapist. I'm not the teacher. You're talking to a great teacher here. Um, and, and that's what you do for a living. But but that isn't that isn't my jam. So to answer your question, I wanted to throw out that caveat. I'm breathing through my nose all the time, as often as I, as I possibly can. Does that mean 24 hours a day? No, it doesn't. Sometimes I just took a breath through my mouth right there. That's fine. Um, and I, I try to wake up in the morning and do some vigorous breathing, be that Kundalini breathing, which I'm a huge fan of, or Sudarshan Kriya, which I love, sometimes Wim Hof method. Before I go to sleep, I try to do some very slow meditative breathing. Again, Sudarshan Kriya, I think, is a wonderful practice. But again, that's just me. Everyone's different. So the, the foundation, though, of breathing is the easy stuff. And that's the stuff you don't need to sit in a corner to do cross-legged, right? Breathe through your nose, breathe slowly. Uh, make sure you're not defaulting to mouth breathing. At night, make sure you're breathing through your nose. This is simple stuff anyone can do and everyone can benefit from it. Great, thank you for that. Okay, um, the last one. Okay. In the book, you mentioned alternate nostril breathing and the impact on both sides of the autonomic nervous system. Is there any more you can tell us about that? Oh, I thought I was pretty thorough. I'll be a little more thorough right now. So basically, we've got these two different channels, right? Uh, inhaling through the right nostril stimulates the body, increases heart rate, increases blood flow, uh, increases blood pressure. It also tends to stimulate the left side, the analytical, quote unquote, side of the brain more. Left nostril has the opposite effect, calms you down, lowers heart rate. So there's been studies on this stuff for the last 20 years. Um, 
what I think is interesting is that yogis have been practicing this for, they didn't have capnometers. They didn't, weren't able to look at HRV or galvanic skin response, or they didn't have EEGs or EKGs or anything else, but they knew the effects that these breathing practices were having, which is why they've been around for thousands of years, which is why when you go to a yoga class now, a lot of them start with, they call it alternate nostril breathing. Also, that it known as Nadi Shadhana, you know, is is the yoga term for it. So, uh, you know, beyond that, if you just understand the, I'm sure there's more subtleties. Um, maybe there's there's different things happening in in your blood gases when you're breathing through this um, way. I included these studies on the website in the back of the book, and um, anyone can choose to take a a deeper dive if should they choose and one of the benefits is you breathe lighter because you don't have enough room you create more more resistance to the breath and that's you, another benefit you breathe lighter you breathe slower there's more pressure so um yeah and and that's but it is interesting um the the hemodynamic changes in the body and and the neurological changes that that occur i'm not sure that those are tied to just breathing slower and lower otherwise you'd be able to just breathe slower through both of your nostrils like this and have those same effects and and you don't so it's fascinating stuff and what's so great about all this stuff is you can measure it. A lot of people at home with wearables can measure what happens to their blood sats, what happens to their heart rate, what happens to their blood pressure, their HRV and more by just changing your breathing. So you don't have to believe us, right? <laughs> believe yourself. Believe the numbers on these instruments that are showing you how your body is changing. Good. And I promise that was the last one, but here is a good one. There will be a breath part two. Can you tell us a little bit about your next projects? Or you just if have to I chill was, out? If I was a smart business person, uh, yeah, maybe there would be. But I'm a terrible business person. There will not be a breath part two, people. Uh, it is not going to happen. I put everything I could, everything I knew about breathing into this book. And this book is, uh, you know, it's not perfect. I did the best I could. So, but I'm not writing another. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm moving on and uh, I'm so excited after having had the pleasure and privilege of talking about this book, being on, you know, podcasts and all that for the past year and a few months that I leave next week for two months to start anew. So I'm starting a, a literally a new new chapter in my life of, of research to start a new book and I'm logging off all electronic devices and i'm just going to go back to listening and learning instead of talking so i'm really really excited to to get back into that mental space and uh and to dig into another subject that i'm really excited about good we really want to know about that and i'm not going to tell you what it is okay, okay. that's the next it's question not going to know the expectations but i know not it has been working. <laughs> definitely not breathing okay i know you has been working on video series for breath breath how is that going when we will top secret stuff don't know where, okay. you, where you heard that <laughs> top secret so yes um, i did my research what are you, <laughs> you certainly did you got access to my inbox um <laughs> so what I, I we we are in certain stages of development on a possible miniseries um that if this goes through fingers crossed i'll have an excuse to go travel the world for for a year relive some of these experiences but most importantly dig even deeper into this research not in, just into breathing but many different aspects so i love writing books because i love being alone i love being in my own head i love that process. Um, so uh, I'm going to try to balance these two things. If, if the mini series happens, great. But I have to be working on a book in the background and, and moving forward in some way. So that's what I'm doing for the next two months. Uh, and we'll, we'll see what happens after that. I hope this project just makes a reality because a lot of people don't read, but a lot of people watch videos. So yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Uh, you know, it's a it's very easy when, well, not very easy, but when you work on books, you, you've you got one boss, it's you. You've got one employee, it's you. When things don't get done, you can blame someone. 
it's you. <laughs> it's you control your universe. You decide what route, who you're going to interview. I really like that. When you start working with large groups of people, you lose that control and things can spin out of control pretty easily. So, you know, uh, I'm cognizant of that. We'll see what happens in the, you know, when it all comes down to it, though, I am, uh, I love writing books. Uh, and that's, that's my thing. And uh, I will never stop doing that. Hopefully this other thing can complement that, but, but that's my main thing. We hope you never stop. Yeah, well, because thank you very I much. I really enjoy to write your books. And okay, finally, I just want to thank you. Uh, really, your work has been very important for all of us and for the breeding world for a lot of people. So has been an amazing tool for me to create awareness. And I'm very happy to have your book now in Spanish. And I hope we still in touch and let us know what, what is next. And I hope to see you here in Colombia sometime. Maybe you can take ayahuasca with me and my family. We'll see what happens. Thanks a Let's lot see for what having happened. me. <laughs> Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, good luck, everybody, on Facebook and Instagram and wherever else you are. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.